So, a little while ago, which may or may not mean several months in these circumstances, I said I'd take a little cultural reconnoiter into the colourful lives of the inhabitants of the plains of Eidolon, namely, the Ostrons. As we know, these delightfully rustic people have constructed a small town named Cetus around the colossal Orokin Tower slash meat dispensary home to the elusive entity known only as the Unum. But how did they get there in the first place? Were they here all along, or did they come later? Well, fortunately we have the answer to that question in the form of several ornamental fish cruelly ripped from an old lady's mantelpiece and scattered across the plains for us to find. Each fish lets us in on a small snippet of lore surrounding both the Ostrons and the plains, but they also include audio files that, when strung together, tell the epic tale of Cetus's origins. If that ain't a good place to start, I don't really know what is. Once upon a time, in the age after the fall of the Orokin, there existed a collective of trading clans, or clades, called the Ostrons. These clades wandered the solar system, scavenging what they could find and squeezing value out of things that others would overlook. Amongst these clades was one of the most prestigious named the Yingbrandr. The Blergenjordner. Ugh. The Yingbindunyai, meaning Great Bond. A young woman belonging to this family named Erfriha had fallen in love with a man named Mersa. <sighs> Pause for obligatory R. Oh who, much to her father's chagrin, was Cetus, or Cladeless, due to the massacre of his family by the Grenier years before. Hmm, cheery. Quite predictably, mean old Pap-Pap forbade Erfriha from seeing Mersa, and in response, the two little scamps ran away together. I mean, it seems sweet, but as the motivation for this exodus was a mysterious voice in Mersa's head beckoning him to Earth to start a new life, you can kind of see where Dad was coming from. The Yurblood nerd here presumed the pair dead and got on with their lives, but in reality, Efriha and Mersa were drawn to Earth by the tasty piece of real estate that we know as the Tower of the Unum. Years passed, and the legend of a woman inexplicably living on the poisoned Earth began to arise amongst travelling traders. They would contact her regularly and share stories of their families and friends, and while she kept decidedly stum about her own life, she would always inquire about how the Yubrugnerdur were getting on. Eventually, this attracted the attention of her long-lost family, who came looking for their long-absent relative. On arrival, Erfriha bade them to make their home around a huge Orokin ruin, promising prosperity and safety for years to come. Apparently very easily swayed, the Ostrons travelled to the designated location, but their passage was blocked by spiteful Grenier. Pleasant as ever, eh? Fortunately for the Ostrons, the Unum intervened and disabled the Grenier's weapons and technology as they came close to the tower. Performance issues? You know, 4 out of 10 Grenier. The Yagbablundai began to set up a town near to the tower and named it Carafamil, meaning family and prosperity. The settlement developed quickly under the protection of Erfriha, who had formed some sort of pact with the beasts of the land, which sounds suspiciously similar to the way the Unum used Kuva to control the wildlife in the Gara legend. Mersa, being a sulky Sally, wouldn't enter the town, presumably because it would ruin his edgy loner mystique. He knew that one day Efriha would leave him to return to her family's side, and thus decided to let her go. Ugh, drama queen. In the years preceding this, Mersa had taken to living as a man of the sea, whatever the hell that means, becoming some sort of aquatic archaeologist, fishing and hunting for lost knowledge deep in the ocean. Over the years, he'd gathered a small collection of gifts from the Earth itself that apparently gave him some insight into the lifespan of a world. Right. One fateful night, Mersa sailed out into the sea on his boat, taking his collection of miscellanea and rather obstinate attitude with him. It was here that he dove into the sea and, brace yourselves, transformed into a giant fish. Yeah. Obviously the intention here is to convey some kind of mystical metamorphosis, but all I can think of is that the Grenier MAY have been dumping radioactive waste in the ocean. With Mersa gone, Erfriha's grief for the loss of her husband broke down the accord she had with the surrounding wildlife, and as a result, the Ostrons were forced to rebuild the Great Orokin Wall that had surrounded the tower in times gone by. Ugh, Mersa, you just had to ruin it for everyone, didn't you? Erfriha eventually passed away, and in the ten days after her burial, a huge fish was seen standing vigil over her grave. Presumably not with actual legs, because if so, I'm doubling down on the toxic waste thing. Eventually, the fish left. The Ostrons renamed their town Cetus so it could be a home to all those Cladeless, and the legend supposedly ends here. 
Since then, Cetus has become a thriving trader's hub for all, with even the Corpus welcome should they adhere to the ceasefire rules that surround the town. Although, I do wonder if the Unum doesn't have a hand in that, considering her intervention with the Grenier. The town has a mining and fishing industry, but mainly subsists off of trading the many useful materials harvested from the ever-regenerating Unum. She designates what parts may be harvested, and the Ostrons blow off massive chunks of her flesh with explosives for deconstruction and sale. How, uh, generous. The flesh can be eaten or traded, and the oils can be refined into unguents and medicines. Of course there's always Kuva with its mysterious value and origins, but the Ostrons also sometimes scavenge Orokin technology from the parts of the tower they expose. Starting to sound a little bit like stealing somebody's kidney, but if the quills are fine with it, I suppose it can't hurt. Which brings us quite nicely onto our next topic. I've spoken briefly about the Unum before in my previous planes video, but let's go a little bit further down the rabbit hole this time. We know the Unum is a huge, meaty tower that supposedly possesses the power of prophecy, and is said by many to sit at the pin centre of the universe, listening to the infinite poetry of cause and effect, which, whilst sounding very colourful and 10 out of 10 for creativity, is a touch too vague for my taste. What the nature of this ability is exactly is up for debate at the moment, with so little information available. I've heard theories that the Unum is akin to the Neural Sentries in other Orokin Towers that have a more sinister link with the Corrupted than she does with the Quills, or that she's some sort of highly advanced prediction engine that uses simulations of possible realities to narrow down the ideal path forward to best serve her own agenda, whatever that may be. She could even actually possess some supernatural multiverse vision. I mean, come on, we are talking about a sci-fi game here. But I'm inclined to think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Whatever the reality, eh, our best bet for gleaning any insight at the moment is through her devout followers, the Quills. Our only exposure to this mysterious group is through Sire's long thought dead husband Onko, who in reality was hiding 50 feet away from town in a cave with a bucket on his head. Honestly, giant fish, bucket hermits, see it's really needs a marriage counsellor. Yeah, maybe not. Onko seems to have changed since joining the Quills, having adopted a more robotic speech pattern that almost sounds as if he's recording his interactions or checking off social cues rather than actually having a conversation with you. His dialogue shows that the Quills have formed some sort of hive mind with the Unum, being able to tap into her ability to see multiple possible realities, as he regularly claims to have knowledge of future conversations with you. He also often struggles finding the correct tense when forming a sentence, having to do a few run-ups till he gets it right. This, to me, implies that the Quills' minds have been warped by melding with the Unum, opening their minds so that they might better serve her as agents to be sent out to record and influence possibilities and consequences. Now, yeah, this is a really cool concept, but uh, I have a few quibbles, shall we say. Surely this trial and error approach would harm as many realities as it helped, and is it just a coincidence that Onko refers to himself as Quill Onko Primary, rather than Secondary, Tertiary, Quaternary, and so on? Is our reality in Warframe some sort of primary timeline with branching possibilities, or are we just one of many? At this point, I'm inclined to believe the Unum is one of two things. Either she is an incredibly advanced prediction engine run by some sort of Cephalon-like being capable of running countless simulations to divine the best possible course of action according to some presumably Orokin design, or she is truly some sort of living void god that can see into other dimensions with the intention of learning from potential consequences to best influence our reality. There are points both for and against each of these potential scenarios. For instance, how could even an incredibly advanced machine have that kind of predictive capacity? But equally, surely a living god with so much power could have predicted the old war and prevented it. Honestly, I'm stumped. You can read into it whichever way you want. Lord knows I keep flip-flopping between these possibilities. I've rewritten the last bit so many times now I don't even remember my initial impression. Either way, the Unum and the Quills clearly have a vested interest in tweaking the course of events, sending you out to hunt Eidolons and hinting at your future, but as to how they got this power and what they're actually planning to do with it, I suppose we'll have to wait and see. Swazdola, everyone, and thank you ever so much for watching. I've consulted the Unum, and she's assured me that to achieve the best possible consequences, you should uh, you should go and press that like button down there. And if you'd like to see more of this nonsense, you can subscribe to my channel. If you'd like to talk about what we covered, you can comment down below or join my community Discord in the description. Quite appropriately, I suppose, I had uh, too many branching tangents I wanted to explore in this video, and we could have been here for ages if I had, so uh, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing all your theories down below. I had a lot I wanted to talk about that I didn't get to. 
As always, guys, I've been Luke, this has been Lawframe, and you've been just a delight. Shola, nerds!